If you have or suspect you may have a health problem, or if you require answers to specific health care questions or concerns, you should consult your physician or health care provider and not depend solely on information presented in this program. Most people dread going to the dentist, but did you know that those twice yearly visits could actually save your life? In this edition of To Your Health, we'll learn how your dentist can detect cancer, heart disease, and other systemic issues just by looking in your mouth. We'll also meet a dentist who saved her patient's life by diagnosing a life-threatening condition during a routine dental exam. It's a heart-pounding story you definitely want to hear. We'll also hear from a dentist who's doing what he can to save leukemia patients, again, through his patient's routine visits. And we'll explore the healing and faith connection with a dentist who has served and treated the poorest of the poor on missionary trips around the world. That's all coming up next on To Your Health. Hi, I'm Portland Helmick. We're talking today about oral health and how it can be a gateway to diagnosing other health conditions. You wouldn't think so, but your dentist just might save your life. Joining us is Dr. Maria Ryan, a professor and the chair of the Department of Oral Biology and Pathology at the Stony Brook School of Dental Medicine. She was recently elected vice president of the American Association for Dental Research and has written extensively on the subject of oral health and its relationship to conditions like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, strokes, and potentially adverse pregnancy outcomes. Thanks so much for being here, Dr. Ryan. Well, thank you for inviting me, Portland. So I think that this is a new concept for lay people, maybe not for people in your profession, but I think that for a lot of us, we wouldn't think that there's a connection between the health of our mouth and chronic conditions like diabetes or heart disease. What, what is that correlation? Well, people often don't think about it because they think of their teeth separately. But in fact, our mouth is connected to the rest of our body. And so what drives many of the diseases that we treat in dentistry are the presence of bacteria in the oral cavity and the inflammation that they cause. And those two things coming together within the oral cavity can increase a patient's risk for developing diseases such as diabetes, such as cardiovascular disease, and even uh, respiratory diseases like pneumonia and uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes like preterm delivery. So what's the link though? So if I have gum disease or I have inflammation, that tells you what? Well, it tells you, first of all, that um, the chance of the bacteria which are present in the oral cavity that are driving this to get into the bloodstream is there. And once they get gain entry into the bloodstream, they can be found in atherosclerotic plaques within the vessels which can drive um, your risk for having a heart attack or a stroke. They can be found in the amniotic fluid, uh, which can drive the risk for preterm delivery. Uh, and they can gain entry into the lungs, driving the risk for developing lung diseases. So when you're looking in someone's mouth, are you able to tell by looking at the levels of inflammation or gum disease that someone may develop one of these conditions or you can actually tell that they have the they have diabetes for example by looking in the mouth well diabetes is i think the most interesting connection and there's a lot of data to support that it's actually a two-way street so we've known for quite some time that people who have uncontrolled diabetes can develop long-term complications of the disease and so the ones that we're most aware of are heart disease and kidney disease and even eye disease, um, neuropathy, nerve disease, and wound healing problems. But one of the other long-term complications of diabetes is periodontal disease. And so if you have diabetes and it's not well controlled or you have not been diagnosed with it yet, you could develop very aggressive periodontal disease or gum disease. And so if we have a young individual who comes in and they have very aggressive periodontal disease, one of the things that we may look at and to screen for is whether or not they have diabetes. But diabetes is a two-way street in that if you have periodontal disease and it's not treated, the inflammation associated with that can actually cause insulin resistance in someone who's not yet diabetic. And this can drive the development of what we call pre-diabetes. 
and those individuals may actually go on to develop diabetes. So not only can diabetes increase your risk for oral disease, but oral disease can increase your risk for developing diabetes. So it goes both ways. How is this awareness having an impact on the training of dentists? Now that you recognize that there's a link between oral health and these conditions, are dentists being trained differently? Uh, well, fortunately for me, I graduated from Stony Brook University where we were trained with our medical colleagues. So we have always considered ourselves to be physicians of the mouth. So just detectives like detectives of the mouth, yeah, detectives, physicians, and it's interesting because if you think about it and you go into medicine, very often you may specialize in a certain area, and as dentists, we specialize in oral health, and so that training alongside our medical colleagues really gives us the knowledge that we need in order to make these connections and to develop the personalized care that p individuals need based on their risk. So for example, there are a number of systemic diseases that could increase your risk for developing oral disease. And we mentioned diabetes. Another one is osteoporosis or osteopenia, which is very common in women. And we also now recognize that untreated oral disease can increase your risk for various systemic conditions. So it requires us now as dentists to work very closely side by side with other healthcare providers such as our physician colleagues. Can you tell us about this instance when you had a patient who, I guess you were doing a, a routine dental exam on her and you noticed something in her mouth that was very alarming? Yes. I. I had a, a young woman in her 40s, uh, mother of four children, who had not been seen by me for almost two years, because as most mothers do, she was taking care of her children and not herself. Mm -hmm. And she came in and we noticed that her periodontal condition had really progressed very rapidly, much more than one would expect in such a short, short span of time that I had a, not seen her. And that's like gum recession? Yeah, gum disease. Mm -hmm. And she had a lot of inflammation. And you know, the signs of the disease are when you brush, it might bleed. Uh, when you spit in the sink, you might see blood. Um, your gums look red while your teeth are, might be very nice and white. And so she had pretty significant periodontal or gum disease. And so as I began to talk to her, I also noticed that she had some fractures in her teeth. And I said, what's going on with you? And she said, I'm chewing ice all the time. What is chewing ice a sign of? Well, it can be a sign of anemia. And um, if you are anemic, your heart has to pump harder to get the oxygen throughout the body. So the fact that she had been chewing ice for such a long time and we saw all these little fractures in the teeth gave us a signal that something else was going on. So when I get up every morning and I brush my teeth, as all of us do, and I put the toothpaste on the toothbrush and I look in the mirror, what should I be looking for? What signs might say to me, mm, there's something going on here, there's an issue? So if you have bleeding when you're brushing and flossing or you're spitting in the sink, that can be a sign of periodontal disease. If you see that there are spaces that develop between your teeth or your teeth become loose, also a sign. What Other if your teeth e easily fracture? If your teeth easily fracture, you may have other issues with regards to caries. So if you have pain, you need to address that because you might have a cavity that needs to be looked at. Or if you have ulcers that are not healing or pain within the mouth, you need to look at that because it could be a sign of cancer. And leukemia may even present itself with changes within the gingival tissues. And the other area that we look at beyond um, TMJ problems, joint problems, um, is uh, the presence of oral cancer. So dentists usually are looking for cavities, they're looking at your gum condition, periodontal disease, and then they look for ulcerations and other um, cancers that could occur within the oral cavity, oral cancer, oral and pharyngeal cancer. What's interesting is that it's all connected. It is all connected. Every organ's connected to everything else. And I'm so glad that you see that, and I hope that your audience learns something about that in today's interview. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. When we come back, how one dentist tries to save people from leukemia by helping to find bone marrow donors during his patient's routine dental visits. 
We'll talk with him next. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're talking today about dental health. Dentists can save our lives in more ways than one. Our next guest is Dr. Steve Conlon. He's a dentist in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and he's leading a charge to save people from leukemia through a campaign to register bone marrow donors during routine dental visits. Dr. Steve Conlon joins us via Skype. Dr. Conlon, it's good to have you here. Thank you for having me. So what inspired you to begin this bone marrow registry within your dental practice? So uh, roughly 10 years ago, my father-in-law, who also was a practicing dentist, lost his life to acute myelogenous leukemia. It happens to be a particular type of blood cancer that requires, in most cases, a life-saving bone marrow donation to survive. My father-in-law, unfortunately, didn't make it to that process. But after his passing, uh, my family and I decided to get involved in any way we could to kind of change that paradigm. Um, I had a patient in my office who also had the same malady at the exact same time, a fellow named Joel Carter, who was able to receive a life-saving bone marrow donation. And he's been my partner in this charge ever since he got well enough to help us out. And how long have you been doing it? Um, our first statewide campaign was in 2012. But I had been doing it in my practice in a smaller, a smaller way prior to partnering with DKMS and also the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society at the time. And why are dentists the ideal practitioners to be able to conduct this registry? Well, I see healthy people as opposed to most people when they go to the physician usually have something wrong with them. So we kind of thought we would incorporate it into our routine dental visit to ask people to register. Since we're getting the sample that we need from a cheek swab, we figure we're kind of the ideal, ideal person in the chain as far as uh, healthcare providers to ask. Um, also, we have great trusting relationships with our patient base. So a lot of times what prevents people from becoming potential donors is A, they don't know that there's a need or B, that there's some fear or misconception of what it is to be a donor. Have you been able to inspire other dentists to do the same thing? Sure. So we started out small scale here in my community in West Michigan and then ended up partnering with Michigan Dental Association and we ran two statewide campaigns. Following that, uh, we were picked up by both the New York State Dental Association and then the Georgia De Dental Association who replicated our efforts here in the state. Now this has grown to a national level campaign through our partnership with the Henry Schein Cares Foundation as well as DKMS and the support of the American Dental Association where we, we kicked off a national event um, this past fall in Denver. And this was all your idea? It started with me and my buddy Joel, who's a 10-year survivor right now. And how many patients have you been able to register? So personally in my practice, it's 500 in my practice, about 500 in the community. And our first goal, our first drive in the state of Michigan was 2,500. This thing's kind of grown out of my hands now, so I don't have perfect data for you for what's going on around the country, but there are 100 active practices right now participating in drive efforts today. And that number peaks and valleys based on whether they want to do it year long or perhaps they want to do a month long initiative or a couple of weeks and they drop in and drop that out of the program. And it's just as simple as a cheek swab and then you just have that person's information on file. Um, yeah. So, um, you have to fill out some basic health demographic data. Um, you have to fit a, a certain health perspective. You need to be a healthy individual between the ages of 18 and 54. Um, it takes probably 30 seconds to take the sample from a cheek swab, you take two of them, mail it off to DKMS, and then they put you in the bank. And then you're in the bank until you, you age out. Have you found any matches between your patients and people in need of bone marrow? Sure. So in my particular practice, I've had, out of the samples that we've gotten, I've had 15 people contacted. They did not go on to donate, but out of our first drive in the state of Michigan, nine donations to date. Nine donations to date. And is the bone marrow useful for people not only who have leukemia, but who have other diseases as well? Sure. So um, aside from blood cancers, there are some patients with sickle cell anemia who can have a bone marrow transplant for, transplant for a cure. Sickle cell anemia. Okay. Right. And why is this so important to you? I mean, it sounds like obviously it's because of your father-in-law. Uh, so that's the impetus too, but it's rather remarkable that uh, a, a very small altruistic thing that takes you two minutes to register for, you truly can save someone's life. It's not like, it's not like giving blood. It's a lot more like donating um, a solid tissue organ. Um, 
usually if someone calls you to do this, it's a life or death situation. There are some blood cancers that just do not respond to um, chemotherapy, and the only way that this patient can survive is to have this donation for them. When people come into your office now for just a routine checkup, do you tell them right away, this is what we're doing and we'd like you to join yeah, the so, registry? So when we're doing active drive periods in my office, and just because of the nature of how a dental practice works, I, I pretty much see the same group of people every six months except for new, new patients. So you can't ask them all the time because a lot of my patients are already who fit this parameter uh, have already decided they will donate. But usually how we work at my practice is my dental hygienist will discuss this during a hygiene visit. And if the patient is so inclined that we do the donation during that visit. About how many people say, okay, yeah, I'll do it, half and half? You know, I, I would say that most people who fit the age range between 18 and 54 and are healthy enough to donate uh, generally respond very favorably. Uh, you know, we do answer a lot of questions because there is a misconception of what it is to be a donor. And we're also very... Um, adamant that if they do sign up that if they're called upon it they have to they have to donate what's they the can't really just sign up because they want to they want to please me because i always tell them well what if you're the only petition potential recipient for a child in need somewhere across the country and you're too busy to donate and that child's going to perish so I, I you know I'm very careful about telling them if you're going to sign up we want you to be serious about signing up and what are the misconceptions about being a donor well because most people think it's going to cost them time or money or it's going to be painful or it's going to disrupt their life and and that's just not the case um, when they ask someone to be a bone marrow donor um, they spend considerable amount of time making sure that that their safety is taken care of and any costs that are born are born not from the donor but from the recipient or the recipient's insurance carrier and most people have this horrible idea of what it is to donate. Most of the don most of the donations are done with a it's called a peripheral blood draw, where they'll take blood out of one arm and filter it. And it usually takes about four or five hours to do filter out the stem cells and put the blood back on the other side. But on occasion, a transplant doctor or transplant team may decide that they would rather have um, a surgical donation where they sedate the patient and take bone marrow generally from the crest of the hip. But most of those patients still a little bit of soreness for a day or two, and truly you've saved someone's life. It's really important. I would never associate dentistry dentistry with bone marrow don donation, but you've done it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was a, a, a little bit of happenstance, and really the, the motivation, as much as my father-in-law is this this fellow who we took care of during his time frame of, of being transplanted, and it's a very precarious time in his life, and. He's been kind of my uh, my sidekick through this whole thing, even through his ups and downs with his health being a, um, a transplant recipient, which is sometimes a challenging place to be. But he's been fantastic, and he's an inspiring guy. And we're, we're happy to do it to honor him and honor my father-in-law. And I'm happy to talk to you today. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my pleasure. When we come back, we'll be joined by dentist Dr. Stanton Young. He's going to share some powerful stories of treating the poorest of the poor around the world and talk about the connection between health and faith. It's something you definitely don't want to miss. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're here with Dr. Stanton Young, a dentist who has a private practice in New York City, but who's also traveled on missionary trips all over the world to serve and treat people living in dire poverty, many of whom had never seen a dentist or had a dental checkup before. Dr. Young has witnessed faith and healing working together many times, and he's here to tell us about his experience. Dr. Young, thanks so much for being here. Happy to be here. So you have this busy practice in New York City, and yet you've traveled all over the world treating people, offering dental exams to people who are very, very underprivileged. What motivates you to do this? I would say it's because we are very fortunate and privileged in this country, and I believe that true and pure religion is um, ministering to widows and orphans and poor people um, in their physical needs. So there are a lot of dentists that do that, and I had an opportunity to go um, once when I was in dental school, and then I've continued to take many more opportunities over the years. How many places have you been? I've been to Guatemala, Costa Rica, Guyana, Colombia, Mozambique, Nigeria, um, Haiti, Russia. That's amazing. So paint me a picture of what it's like on one of these dental missionary trips. Give me a sense of the conditions and how you actually treat people. Each country is different and we typically try to go to a really underserved area. So for example, in maybe Guyana, 
we would we had to get in boats or canoes and travel across water to these villages where they didn't have any <clears throat> other transportation and people would walk through whatever trees and fields and show up and there'd be a big line of them and we would set up a makeshift clinic on benches and tables and we would have um, buckets of water that we would bring in typically wouldn't have plumbing or electricity and how do you treat without electricity well we're limited so it would be primarily extractions uh, and cleaning things like that where you just need forceps elevators certain dental instruments and sometimes we would have a, a battery or a gasoline powered generator if we needed but mostly it was people holding flashlights or using the sun and uh, and buckets with um, glutaraldehyde and to sterilize the instruments and people would be scrubbing them cleaning them between surgeries and people would line up and they'd come and lay on a bench or a table and we would often have an interpreter and someone a volunteer to hold the flashlight or to hold someone's hand to comfort them because some of these people had never been treated before so it was probably scary yes. so some of them were terrified and and would stand behind the tree watching and then they'd see other people walking away from the table who were happy and so and they screamed and but we we were mostly trying to address people who were in pain who had a broken abscess tooth that they hadn't been able to chew on for a month or a year or and some of them can be life-threatening so that's what we would do but as far, and as far as cleaning people hadn't seen seen a dentist in five ten years or maybe never then yeah we would clean their teeth and that would provide a great service for them and what kind of an impact can it have if you've never you know had a professional cleaning or you haven't gone for 15 years or more what are the long-term health effects well oral health is is absolutely uh, related to general health so if you don't keep your teeth clean then you will tend to have plaque and calculus build up on them and that will cause inflammation of your tissues the gingiva and that in turn can will make the your gums bleed and allow bacteria in your mouth which is your all mouths are full of bacteria to get into the bloodstream and circulate throughout your system affecting your cardiovascular health and all of your systems so having a clean mouth is really important i've traveled with physicians as well who have done all sorts of surgeries myomectomies taking out tumors and i remember one time in guyana a woman couldn't breathe through one of her sinuses and we took out an abscess tooth and found out that she had a, a large cyst and we removed that and and my assistant who was not a nurse um couldn't quite handle all the, the blood and and seeing someone's tissues opened up and and the flashlight kept moving off her face and so I turned and she was white as a sheet and and just about ready to pass so someone had to come and relieve her and that would be me <laughs> <laughs> and um I would sometimes see these people and I what um, did you see I'd see them I'd see their their bare feet and, and calloused and battered and well, I saw I saw a lot of things mm -hmm. that moved you mm -hmm. and made you feel blessed, made you feel fortunate. Mm -hmm. This is really important work for you, right? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. It it can be it can be moving um, when you see the level of poverty that these people experience. It it makes you I, I come back home thinking I'm just amazed right, right. How, there how, before the grace of God how I. fortunate yes mm -hmm. and why we should be so privileged to have not just a pair of shoes to have several to have a comfortable bed to sleep on instead of a dirt floor I bet these people are so grateful to you I think I think they appreciated it yeah and you do you teach them about dental care while they're there Oh, absolutely I think that's one of the best things we can do just teaching them to brush their teeth um, do they have toothbrushes um, typically a lot of the places we go no they don't so we I always would bring a few hundred to is pass it a out. new concept to them do they know that they should be using well, them the, or the they further just... you are removed from modern society the, the less likely you're going to have that and the, and the greater 
the poverty is, the less likely people are going to have that privilege to have a toothbrush. Maybe they have one for the family. Maybe they don't have the education to realize how important it is to brush their teeth. So you hand out toothbrushes, toothpaste. You toothbrushes, tell about we usually floss. run out of toothpaste, mm -hmm. um, but we, I'll bring a few boxes of it, yes. Dental floss, that's a new concept for them. They, you'll find them using it to tie things together in their huts or whatever. <laughs> and, um, but I think the brushes are the primary thing. And just good oral hygiene is really important, not just out in the bush, but, but here in the States as well. Do you have another trip planned soon? I don't have one. I would like to bring my children. I have four children, and I would like to bring them on my next trip because I think it would be a great experience for them to play with Native kids in other countries and also for them to realize how fortunate they are here. Mm -hmm. So what do you think uh, what do you think about the role of faith in healing? What role does it play? Well, I think that uh, I think faith is is a wonderful thing. I think it's a gift from God, and I think with great faith, you can move mountains. So um, and I think it can aid healing, all sorts of healings. Um, I think a lot of times faith may God may answer a prayer not just through an outright miracle, which I don't deny happen, but he may use, put it on someone's heart, like myself or another dentist or a physician or a nurse or whoever, to volunteer their time to make a trip like that. Mm -hmm. It's lovely. You do really important work. Thank you. Thank you for being here. That's our show for today. So check out our show page for more information on this episode. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, here's to your health.